Hello, stargazers. Welcome to this presentation on planning a visual variable star observing program. My name is Michael Cook, and I've been an amateur astronomer for 45 years. I'm a uh, member of the American Association of Variable Star Observers, or AAVSO. And uh, I'm going to be referencing many resources that are available to you uh, from the association in this presentation. Uh, just so you know, uh, through a serendipitous discussion uh, with Facebook friend uh, Alastair Leith, we agreed that this might be a good topic to share with the OAS crowd. So um, let's get at it. Okay. Did I get that right? Yes, we did. Next slide. Let me cover a few basics. So what is a variable star? Well, it's a star that changes or varies in brightness. Astronomers use the term magnitude to describe the brightness of any celestial object that emits in optical wavelengths. The star is at minima when faintest and at maxima when brightest. The difference between maxima and minima is termed amplitude. The graph shown here is a light curve of a variable star that is changing its magnitude over time. From trough to trough, or sorry, from trough to peak, from trough to peak would be the amplitude of the star, how it changes in brightness from maxima to minima. And the time from one peak to the next peak, or from one trough to the next trough, is the period. The period can be from minutes to years long, depending on the type of variable star. And I'll get into all the different kinds of variable stars later on in the presentation and point you to, to some resources for further reading on that. Now, astronomers observe and study variable stars to get data about various properties, such as mass, radius, characteristics, etc., like that. And we use that data to increase our understanding of the universe in general and in stellar evolution in particular. You know, it was less than 100 years ago, in fact, just prior to 1923, that we did not know the true size of the universe. We thought the entire universe was composed of our Milky Way galaxy. It turns out that all those little faint, fuzzy, nebulous, cloud-like objects you see in your telescope that, that we are seeing, uh, that we were seeing, are, are in fact separate galaxies outside of our own galaxy. And it was through the observation of a particular type of variable star in another galaxy that we didn't know was another galaxy that enabled humans to figure out and determine how big the observable universe really is. I want you to remember that year, 1923. Now, if you're wondering if variable astro star astronomy is for you, I'm going to share this lovely quote with you by William Tyler Alcott. He's the founder of the AAVSO back in 1911. 1911. It is a fact that only by the observation of variable stars can the amateur turn his modest equipment into practical use and further to any great extent the pursuit of knowledge in its application to the noblest of sciences. The amazing thing about this quote is that it was written before 1923, 1911, before we knew how variable star would tell us the true size of the universe. And to this day, thousands of citizen scientists that happen to be amateur astronomers continue to observe and contribute to the science of, of astronomy through variable star observation. So now you know what variable stars are and how useful they can be. It's pretty clear that there's a tremendous value in observing these objects. So let me show you how you can get started. I'm going to show you how to select variable stars that you would have an interest in observing. The list of stars you select will become your program stars, as we call it. Then I'll show you how to find your variable star targets. When it comes time to observe a variable star with your binoculars or telescope, I'm going to cover how to pick comparison stars, or comps as we call them. Comps are stars that don't vary at all in magnitude, and they are used as references to compare and estimate the magnitude of the variable star at the time of observation. And I'm going to finally wrap up with showing you to make all your make sure all your uh, hard work was worth it in your observations. I'm going to go over how to report your observations to, to the AVSO. And there's other organizations you can report to as well. <clears throat> if you didn't know it before, there are nearly 1.5 million variable stars known. And there will be many more discoveries to come. Literally a zoo of stars to choose from. 
You may have learned about some large surveys that have begun or are about to begin. One is called the Large Synoptic Sky Survey, or LSST, which will observe and record the entire night sky every three nights. Every three nights. That's a lot of data. Some observers thought this that these large surveys would spell the end for visual uh, variable star observers. Nothing is further from the truth. The visual astronomers and the work coming out of the surveys will complement each other. By the way, these surveys do have their limitations. They can't observe brighter stars. The surveys cannot, can, can't observe any particular star with sufficient frequency. Remember, it's, it's every three days, whereas the visual astronomer can observe the same star a few times in the night, a few times in the week, few t whatever. So it's a lot better that way that they come to the rescue of the surveys, and the surveys come to the rescues of the va variable star astronomers, the visual astronomers. So they do complement each other. But forget all that. Just make sure you are observing for fun, knowing that you're contributing to science. Now, before you select what kind of variable stars you may want to observe, consider there are over 200 kinds. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this graphic. just want to show you that how things are split apart, split up. Um, variable stars are categorized into groups, then classes, then types. There are a few subtypes as well. A few of the types are broken out in recognition of their additional characteristics and properties. I'll be showing you a resource to read up on the differences of variable stars in a moment. Um, bear in mind that each type of variable star has a story to tell and is a piece of the puzzle of how stars are born, how they live, and how they die. For example, my variables, as you see over on the right, uh, are giving us a glimpse of what the future holds for our sun, because one day our sun will become a red giant probably a Myra type variable. And by studying Myras today, we can figure out what our, what our sun will be going through in, in the very distant future. It's important to recognize that every star was a variable star at some point in its life, when it was born, how it lives its life, and how it dies. So it's easy to see why we need to observe variable stars to advance and expand our understanding of the universe and stellar evolution. So, what should you observe? Well, like I said, 200 kinds to choose from. The trick is to ask yourself, what types of variables do you want to observe? Experienced variable star, uh, star astronomers over the decades have found out that you will be drawn to your favorites once you get to understand what, how, they, um, how they vary. To start, let's head over to the American Association of Variable Star Observers website at aavso.org, and I'm going to show you a document called um, um, types of Variable Stars, A Guide for Beginners. So we're at their website now. I'm logged in. You don't have to be logged in or have an account to see 99% of the stuff on the website. It's a quite amazing website. So uh, using the Variable Stars tab, scroll down a bit, you'll see Types of Variable Stars, A Be Guide for Beginners. This page gives you very good overview of uh, the groups and classes and types of Variable Stars, etc., etc at a very high level, charts and all, graphs and all. But I want you to scroll down to the very bottom, and you'll see a link called Variable Types Within Main Groups. This will take you to a much more detailed document describing all the subtleties of the kinds of variable stars. It's very dry reading, I kid you not, but I'll tell you, it is a wealth of treasure trust of information here to help you decide what kind of variable stars you want to observe. Um, the other th resource I wanted to show you is something called the Variable Star Index, or VSX. It's a uh, database, and the way to get to that is go to Variable Stars tab again, and near the bottom scroll down to Variable Star Index. And VSX is a repository of nearly 1.5 known variable stars. Clicking on the search button, you can put a search term if you know the name of the star, like, you know, Z Ursa Majoris. Let's do that right when we're here. Z-U-M-A. I can just click on the search button down here. And it'll return to us all manner of information regarded to this variable star. Right off the bat, we know that it's, it's been observed. There's been uh, over 105,000 observations. There's all kinds of information here. I won't go into great detail about it. Uh, you know, please, you know, take a look at this resort. It is, resource. It is fabulous. 
and uh, you know it'll, it'll really help you to pick the uh, types of variable stars you'd like to observe for yourself. Another uh, resource I want to show you is over the AVSO are the discussion forums. Uh, if you go into the community tab and scroll a little bit the ways down, you'll see forums. And these discussion forums uh, pretty well break. There's many sections of these forums, but uh, down further on, there's variable star observing, and it discusses like variable stars themselves right here broken down all these different types and it's a great discussions going on here all the time uh, great folks to hang out with uh, lots of very handy information if you're looking for some mentorship or whatnot so head over to the forums is another great resource uh, you may be also interested in, in uh, helping professional astronomers directly and I would um, suggest you over to the AVSO what they call alert notices and uh, over here on the Observing tab, if you scroll down to the third item, it's called Alert Notices and Observing Campaigns. And now this is one aspect of the website, excuse me, where you're going to have to create a, uh, a web account. And what I mean by that is you don't have to pay anything. Uh, you don't have to be a member. All they want is an account. So you create an account name, you know, name and so on, your contact information, and more importantly, your email address because basically these alerts will be sent to you and what it involves is a professional astronomer seeks the help of the AVSO observer network and so they'll say you know could your could your observers help me observe this star and uh, AVSO staff will put together uh, a little uh, page about what is needed from the principal investigator the professional astronomer and the star, star name, its location, and other things, and how often they should be observing it and whatnot. And you'll get that alert notice, um, and so you can get on that star uh, straight away to observe. Um, but uh, very handy to do, too, to get yourself really involved in variable star astronomy. Uh, last thing I want to cover at the website, at least this part of the presentation of the website, are th something called observing sections. And um, again, if you hit the observing tab, second um, one down is called observing sections here are uh, these sections are, devote themselves to as the name su suggests the specific parts of variable star astronomy leading to the, the kinds or types of variable stars so we have the uh, long period variables the cataclysmic variables short period pulsators uh, eclipsing types and uh, young stellar objects now there's a few other sections here that are uh, less germane to germane to my discussion or my presentation, but they do very good work in their own right. One is the solar section, exoplanets, and spectroscopy and high energy network. The exoplanets and spectroscopy really aren't for the visual observer. That requires CCD cameras and some pretty darn well crafted skills to master those things. But I want to share those observing sections with you. You may want to join those observing sections. Uh, and uh, because they have little campaigns and projects that they're always working on. Okay, back to our presentation. Now, to successfully observe variable stars, you need to consider your circumstances and the characteristics of the variable stars that you want to observe. For you, consider your equipment, your eyesight, and your observing location. There's no sense to try to observe stars that are too faint to make a good magnitude estimate and think about how much time you can devote to these observations. For targets, consider the amplitude or difference between a variable star's brightest and faintest magnitude. A star which has an amplitude less than 0.1 magnitude really isn't for the visual observer. Um, you and your eye just cannot discern such small differences. Select variable stars with an amplitude greater than or equal to 0.01 magnitude. Now, don't forget about the magnitude range of the star from its brightest to its dimmest. If you want to trace a star through its full uh, light curve um, cycle, make sure you and your equipment can see the star when it's at its dimmest. So if your telescope can only see to 12th magnitude and you want to see the entire light curve, make sure that you pick variable stars that don't go as dim as 13th magnitude. Think also about the pe period of the star. Some stars take hundreds of days to go from maximum to minimum and back again. Other stars change in brightness in just a few minutes. 
And I'll leave you with considering observing semi-regular or irregular variable stars. They often turn up quite a lot of interesting surprises. Now, here's something that's quite useful at the website as well I wanted to show you. It's called the AVSO target tool. <clears throat> you just click on that big blue button there at the, webs uh, the website. But uh, to get to it, uh, I just brought you to the website back again there. And if you click to your observing tab again, you'll see down near two thirds way down that uh, menu, you'll see AVSO target tool. And we get in there. There we go. Now, what the target tool does is it lists all the variable stars that are sort of requiring observation or have some campaigns or projects involved with them. There's alert campaigns, exoplanets, cataclysmic variables, and so on. What I'm going to do is uh, just let's just click off everything except um, you know the, the the long period variables just to get you know the list a little bit more, um, or sorry, I should say less cumbersome. So now we're just going to filter that list. I just hit the filter button there to filter the list. And here we have only long period variables. Now the first one here, RU Andromeda. I'm going to enlarge that a bit for you so you can see a little better. There we go. Uh, the first record here is RU Andromeda. It gives the uh, coordinates, right ascension, declination of the star. It's in Andromeda. It's a uh, semi-regular star. Minimum maximum magnitude. That's going to be pretty tough to observe there at 14.5 with a lot of uh, most amateur telescopes. But it has a period of 238 days. Uh, observing cadence, meaning you should observe it about every 10 days. It's in the long period variable section. Right now it's not visible because it says right here in black it's in conjunction with the sun. Next one here is ST Andromeda. Same information. Oh, this one, you know, 11.8 is at minimum magnitude and 7.7 .7 maximum magnitude. That's a pretty good target for a uh, typical amateur telescope. Uh, so the last observation was one month ago. So there you go. You know, it hasn't been an observation for a month, but it's required an observing cadence of 10 days. There's a great target for you right there. So get on that one. Uh, if you want to take a moment, too, at the, right here under uh, observability, uh, you can sign up or log in if you already have used this tool. But if you sign up, you can put your geographic location and other um, um, information in about your telescope and whatnot and this tool this tool will tell you if you put that information in and log in the tool will then tell you which of these objects are currently visible about above your local horizon for example so in all in all this tool is very handy for adding targets to your list of stars or program stars um, that you should have okay next thing I want to cover is just a few uh, light curve graphs and I, I, there's just a very small selection here um, of variable star light curves and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each one I just want to illustrate uh, the tremendous variety of light curves that you can contribute to this first one here is uh, a typical uh, well it, the Delta Cepheus was the uh, uh, prototype for Cepheid stars Cepheid variable stars and Cepheids um, have short periods and obvious magnitude range, and there's many that are available uh, for viewing just using binoculars. Um, so it's a great um, beginner star to start out with um, is Delta Cepheid in particular, or the Cepheid variables in general. Very good stars to start out with. Next one is the uh, very favorite amongst visual observers are the long period variables. Um, their periods are much longer and they exhibit regular or semi-regular periods. Now like I said before, you only need to observe these types about every 5 to 10 days. The nice thing about that is that cloudy weather is not much of a hindrance. Cloudy weather, our nemesis. Um, supernovae, if you don't know what supernovae are, these are stars that basically blow themselves to bits. Uh, they're especially fun to observe, especially as you try and monitor the, the decay in their brightness. It's very rare that a typical amateur astronomer will discover a supernova. There's some very capable amateur astronomers out there that have discovered supernovae. But uh, where you can contribute is after the, the nova is discovered, so this nova here, 1987A, was discovered almost magnitude 2, and then it started to dim after it exploded, you know, as it's, cause it's blown to bits into the interstellar medium, 
uh, it's all the star matter is, is di slowly dissipates, the star is fading, and all these data points along this curve represent observations by amateur astronomers that monitor the de decay in the magnitude of the star as it went down to like 14th magnitude. This one here is a, is a supernova 1987A. Um, now, I mentioned how supernovae result in the destruction of the star entirely. Novae, just not supernovae, but novae, do not. Novae occur in a system of two stars whereby the primary, a dense white dwarf star, feeds star matter off the orbiting companion as shown in, that, in, the, in the lower left. Every now and then enough matter builds up on the accretion disk surrounding the white dwarf primary star, and that will eventually build up and result in a fusion explosion. <clears throat> the resulting nova, nova can grow, can show a huge change in brightness, <clears throat> but the system is not destroyed. It just rinse and repeat. It'll, it'll reaccrete matter and go nova again. Now some observers regu regularly patrol recurrent novae, and these variable stars are normally dim, but every now and then, and sometimes with predictable certainty, they will flare up and brighten. We call these events outbursts. It's kind of fun returning to the same set of novae in your observing program, and after many nights of observing, being presently surprised, finding one of them is an outburst. A few nights ago, variable star observer Rod Stubings from Australia recently observed 242 of these in one night and reported 15 outbursts. He normally observes uh, that many any given clear night, and uh, that's quite uh, an accomplishment uh, for Rod. Um, Z-cam stars are truly intriguing. Again, they are like recurrent novae, but you know they, they will brighten and dim, and then they'll go, what's, they'll go through what's called a standstill, as shown by the light curve at the left there. The magnitude of the star basically goes flatline, and usually with a constant brightness of about one-third of its maximum brightness. Now, some stars have been incorrectly classed as Z-cam types, and the AVSO has a campaign to weed those out. Maybe you'd be interested in joining or helping out with that campaign. And to make things even more interesting, we have the reverse novae. Now, here we have R. Corona Borealis. It's the prototype of reverse novae. And such stars, <coughs> excuse me, such stars happily stay at a constant or near constant magnitude and then suddenly go very faint. Now, it all has to do with a shell of stellar mater material uh, being ejected off of the star and inter interacting with the interstellar medium. Uh, the star is being obscured by the expanding shell of dust and gas, and it can be a very slow, long pro process to recover from the faint state as the shell dissipates into the interstellar medium. So observing these stars to detect sudden drops and rises in magnitude is a great little project to, to, to undertake. Another favorite among variable stars are eclipsing types. Of course, Beta Percy or Algol is the prototype that was known to be, to, it was known to vary even in ancient times. Algol is a period of just over 2.8 days, and the variation is vis visible without binoculars or telescope. You just need your eyes. So you can actually notice, you have three days of clear weather, you can actually see Algol uh, dim and brighten. As one, as one eclipses the other, one star eclipses the other, the system changes in brightness because the orbital plane of the system is in our line of sight. Monitoring the timing of mid-eclipse uh, reveals much about the evolution of these binary systems. And you can see how one star in this graph here eclipsed the other and it dipped right here at phase one. Um, now, <clears throat> we all know that stars rotate, but this type is characterized by the rotating into view of very large star spots. Yes, these are like our very own sun's sunspots, but much, much larger. As the spots rotate to the Earth's side of the star so that we can see them on this side, the total surface brightness of the star fades appreciably. In effect, you could estimate the rotation period of such a star by monitoring the change in magnitude. Finally, don't forget about the thousands of irregular variable stars. You can find literally thousands of them in, in VSX. Uh, a large part of them don't have any defined period, but they do vary. And these stars are very poorly studied, and observing them could produce some very interesting surprises for you. So what can you use to find variable star targets? 
first, you need to get yourself a good star atlas. Many star atlases show a good selection of brighter variable stars. You can use computer pr program uh, on a uh, computer planetarium program on a laptop and or some apps that have them on smartphones and tablets that include variable stars. Um, you'll also need a pair, a good pair of binoculars are very helpful with getting yourself acquainted with the broader field of view where a particular variable star is located. Binoculars give a great correct east-west or left-right and north-south up-down view that matches the star atlas. So here's a close-up of Ursa Major showing the bowl of the Big Dipper. We're going to find the variable star called Z Ursa Majoris, a semi-regular long period variable uh, encircled by red there. But wait, we need some comparison stars or comps to make the observation. What do you use? So what we're going to do now is go to uh, something at AVSO website called the Variable Star Plotter. And let me just bring that up for you. Okay. had my browser open, I closed it. Here it's back here. Okay, the variable star plotter is located under the observing tab. And uh, maybe let me enlarge that for you again some more. There we go. Under the observing tab, uh, about half, a little over halfway down, it's called variable star charts, variable star plotter. Once you get in there, I've pre-populated some of the, uh, of the form already. Once you get in here, you want to plot a chart. You put the uh, star name in in the first field. And just follow along here. You can say I want a visual chart. Uh, my field of view um, is 300 arc minutes because I'm using binoculars, which standard 7 by 50 binoculars have about that sort of field of view. I'm going to magnitude 12 because I can't see anything fainter than that anyway in, in my binoculars. And uh, the orientation of the chart, I want north up and east to the left because it's a correct up, down, left, right view. You can fill out some other things here, but you know that's good enough for now. You then click on the button called Plot a Chart right there. And it's going to go off busily and go get your chart for you, very customized exactly the way you want it. And there we have it. If you click on the chart itself, when it returns, you get a nice blow up of it as well. So what you have here in the center is a cross here denoting where the variable star is located. The uh, other stars with numbers next to them, whole numbers, like for example 84, 87, 99, they're actually the magnitudes of the reference stars, the comps, that you're going to be using to compare the magnitude of Z Ursa Majoris. But in effect, 84 is really 8.4, 87 is 8.7, and so on. The decimal points have been removed so that you don't confuse the decimal points with the black stars on the white background. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, you've got uh, some handy information here showing the chart is for Z or some Majoris. It's magnitude range 6.2 to 9.4. Its period is over 195 days, and it's a semi-regular variable with a spectral class of M5. Over on the upper right, you'll see a chart ID number. Uh, that's very important when you need to go to report your, um, report your, uh, your observations. So VSP can be very uh, useful for you um, to find the variable star. So once there, though, once you, you found your variable star and you're ready to make your, your comparison, what, how do you do that? How do you, you know, you got to pick certain comparison stars. Which ones do I pick? Well, you should use at least two for, for sure and more if possible. You want to bracket, these are just tips I'm going to give you, you want to bracket the target magnitude, meaning um, pick a, comp a comparison star that's fainter than the variable is, as it is as you're doing your observation, and then pick the other comparison star uh, brighter. And that way you bracket the variable's magnitude in between these two comparison stars. And then try to pick two comparison stars. And you know, it's not always possible, but you do the best you can. Pick two comparison stars that are not more than 0.5 magnitude apart because that'll help you achieve a much more accurate variable star uh, visual estimate. And here are some tips to making the magnitude estimate. Always make your 
observation with a clear head. Don't let your observation be biased by what you think the magnitude should be because you can go to the AVSO website and there's other reports they say, oh, by the way, Z Ursa Majoris is magnitude 8.6 tonight. And if you see that, you may be biased by your observation that night. So go there with a clear head. The, uh, the target and comp stars should be near the center of the field of view of your binoculars or telescope. And think of placing the, 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 uh, the variable star and a comp star along imaginary line connecting your left and right eyeballs. So orientate your head in the eyepiece or binoculars so you have a nice imaginary line connecting the two. Um, and also beware of something called the Perguigne effect. That effect is, occurs when you stare at something red too long, it will appear to grow brighter. So long period variable stars, and some of them are very red, if you stare at them, they will appear to be grow and appear brighter, and that'll give you the wrong magnitude estimate. So a, ray, a way around that is to quickly glance and make your, your variable star uh, estimate as quickly as possible. Don't stare. Now, let's go on to reporting. To report your observations, you'll need to provide the following bits of information. We've got the star name, the date and time, and that can be in Gregorian year, month, date, uh, or Julian, and you can use a Julian day calendar, and you can look at the ADSO website and other websites to give you a Julian date for the current calendar date. You also need the magnitude estimate of the variable star, the magnitudes of the comparison stars that you used, the chart ID, remember from your chart you printed out, that was from VSP. And you can also put in some AVSO supplied comment codes, which are shown here on the right. For example, if the sky was bright from light pollution or it was full moon or something, or you did it through deep twilight, you can put B as a comment code there. Or if you had poor seeing, you put a W in a comment code. There's also a placeholder to put some notes, be very brief about that. Not required, really. Now here's an example of how you would log your observation. All you need is a spiral bound rule notebook is good enough. Uh, some observers use a spreadsheet uh, on a laptop, like right at the right at the telescope or their observing station at, at night, and immediately they, they enter it, you know, during the time of observation. You know, but use whatever works for you. Some people like to write it down and then they go in the house after and, and, and record the observations digitally. Now once you've recorded your observations, it's time to report them. If you report to the AVS, so you'll need to get an observer code, and that's free to anyone who requests one. You don't need to sign up uh, as a, you need to register at the site to get your observer code because they need to they need to know who you are and contact you with your email in case your observation was kind of like funky or whatnot. But um, you don't need to pay anything. It's free to get an observer code, and uh, you know you get lots of resources that way. And um, at the AVSO website, you can submit your observations individually, and there's a form there to do that. I can show you that in a bit. Or if you have them in a spreadsheet, you can export the observations to a common delimited file, like using Windows Notepad or something like that. And then you just upload the file uh, to the AVSO website. So um, one thing I want to show you about here is the header of the common delimited file. We need to have these six bits of information at the top. So um, so here at the bottom is you know of here is, is the observation Z Ursa Majoris, right? Um, but above that are these six bits of information, all preceded by hashtags. So it's called type, and you're going to put in equals visual. You're making a visual visual estimate. There's your observer code, the software used, well this file that my observations are is called notepad. It could be anything you want that just gives you a comma delimited file and then you saying here my delimiter hashtag delim is equal to comma that's the delimiter I'm using to separate the various pieces of information in my observation uh, the date I'm using is Julian date rather than Gregorian date and then here's just the column header information so the name date magnitude etc so we have Z Ursa Majoris there's the Julian date I am estimated at magnitude 8.5 uh, my seeing was poor that night. That's why my comment code is, is W. I use stars 84 and 87. And there's my uh, um, uh, chart ID. And a and, and little note to myself, my first observation. Um, 
Now, the layout here is very important. When you go to upload a file to the AVSO website, you want to make sure that, um, and we'll go there, we'll just go there again. I'm just going to show you that, um, yeah, uh, to get, to upload your data, assuming you have your data in, in say, Notepad, say Notepad, you go to the tab called Data, and you'll head down well, halfway down. It's called Web Ops Submit Search Data. When I'm there, I can say submit observations individually. And here it's saying I need an observer code because I haven't logged in. And let me do that because I haven't logged in. See, it knows who I am. So now I'm logged in. And let's go to Web Ops and submit observations individually. Okay, now here it's telling me what type of observation are you submitting? I'm going, well, I want a visual observation. That's what I'm submitting. It pre-populates it with my observer code, so you don't need to do that. But you're going to put in here the, the star name, the date, time of observation, magnitude, your comp star uh, identifiers like 8 point, you know, 84 and 87, the chart ID, your comment codes, and your personal comments down here. And you just click on Submit Observation, and away you're, away you're done. Now, this is great to submit you know, only a few observations at a time. That's why you see why um, you know, if you have a, a, a larger file, say, of dozens or even hundreds of observations in something like Notepad or Spreadsheet, you know, if it's in your spreadsheet you want to get into a common and limited file like Notepad, what you want to do is go to Web Ops, and here you think it says here, upload a file of observations. So here it brings you with a page. I'll just enlarge that for you a bit. And you're going to say, choose a file. It's going to open your, um, it's going to open, when you click choose file, it's going to open your uh, um, file manager to your disk. You pick the file, your common delimited file off the disk, and then you just upload, and away you go, and you're done. And uh, that's basically how you upload a whole bunch of observations at the same time. Okay. Um, we covered this, inter-observations individually. I went through that with you already, live. And we did that. So, you know what, I'm going to wrap up by uh, telling you about these four books that are quite handy uh, to understand more about variable stars. One is Understanding Variable Stars by John Percy. Uh, Observing Variable Stars by Jerry Good. Observing Variable Stars, Novae and Supernovae by Gerald North. And Light Curves of Variable Stars, a Pictorial Act. Atlas by uh, Sturkin. Um, also at the AVSO website, you should help yourself to the AVSO's Manual for Visual Observing of Variable Stars. Uh, you can download this manual as a PDF. I think it's about 50 pages or so, 60 pages maybe. maybe. And it's very detailed, a lot more detailed than I was able to present in here for you today. But uh, give that a good read, and I'm sure you, after a while you'll be quite a proficient variable star observer. Now, I've been speaking much about the AVSO, mainly because I'm most familiar with this organization. But there are many other organizations across Europe and in the Southern Hemisphere that, could, that coordinate variable star observation. Uh, for example, the British Astronomical Association has tremendously active variable star section. Uh, there are many aspects of the BAA site that are similar to the AVSO, such as variable star observation programs that you can explore. So take time to uh, browse the, the BAA website to take advantage of the many really great resources they have available to you there too. Um, I'm going to um, conclude with another great quote of mine, or not of mine, <laughs> another great quote that I love. This one was from Leslie Peltier's book entitled um, Starlight Nights, The Adventures of a Stargazer. And some of you may have heard or know about Leslie Peltier uh, or even met him. He did pass away in 1980. Uh, he was a prolific variable star observer. And he wrote, I feel it is my duty to warn others that they approach the observing of variable stars with the utmost caution. It is easy to become an addict. And as usual, the longer the indulgence is continued, the more difficult it becomes to make a clean break and to get back to normal life. Like Leslie, I'm an addict, so you've been warmed, warned. So, um, you know, if you have any questions, you know, please don't hesitate to contact me through my website, um, you know, which is shown right here. I can just pop it up for you. 
there's uh, newcastleobservatory.ca. Uh, right down here, there is a, um, um, a button or in the menu uh, for contact. Just click that there, and you can just fill out your name, email address, subject, and uh, send me whatever questions or comments you may have. And uh, that pretty well wraps it up for me. So thank you for joining me. I uh, hope I wasn't too long. Uh, clear skies and good observing to you all. Thanks for your attention and take care. And we'll see you again sometime real soon. Good night.